this is like our lives. Right? Some days we feel like we're off target most of the time. Uh, but if we could just keep reorienting to our values and vision, it's going to be, we're going to get there eventually. The key is not your perfection, it's your direction. I'll say that again. The key is not perfection, it's your direction. It's your trajectory. A question we can ask ourselves whenever we make decisions is, will this get me closer to my goal or farther away from it? When you're in your leadership team meetings with your core team, you can ask this when a decision comes to the table, is this going to get us closer to our vision and our mission, or is this going to get us further away because we're going to squirrel off on this other thing? And that's going to help you stay on track. Another tip here is to uh, set specific goals to get into your weekly calendar to get you to that val those values or that vision, or else, you know what, it's not going to happen. Most of us know if it's not calendared, it's not gonna get done. Our calendars are huge. If we just think the thoughts like a New Year's resolution and go, oh yeah, that's a good, that's a wish that I have for the future, then we live on this place called Someday Isle, okay? And it's not an island. It's a bad place to be where we say, someday I will do this, someday I will do that. And we live on this Someday Isle and it's a place of failure where we don't actually uh, hit the go button on it. I'm going to encourage you to get one thing onto your calendar because then it builds momentum and you keep moving forward in your goals. Objects in motion tend to, you can finish the phrase, right? They tend to stay in motion and we can make appointments with ourselves. And one other uh, one on this, the second point is to stay on your number one priorities. Stay on your number one priority. So I'll use the actual one uh, the way it's probably designed and that is to say we are number one right but what are your number one priorities uh, uh stories told of bobby bowden he's a, a famous football coach when he was playing college baseball when he was younger um he uh, he hit the ball he never hit a home run in his life um he's more of a singles hitter and he hit one down the the third base line and it went into the corner and he's rounding first he's rounding second the third base coach is saying come on come on come on when he gets to third, the coach actually waves him home, like to go for an inside the park home run. And so he kept chugging and chugging and he beat the throw to home and he's jumping up and down like it's his first home run. And little did he know, the catcher threw the ball to the pitcher, the pitcher threw the ball to the first baseman and he stepped on the base and the umpire called him out. He had not stepped on first base and he was devastated because he just hit an inside the park home run. The reason I bring that story up is if we don't make sure we keep the main thing, the main thing in our life, we're going to find out that we get disqualified from the race. We've got to make sure that we've got clarity on our job description's main points. We have to have clarity with our supervisor of what they want us to be spending a lot of our time on. We've got to talk about ways that we can do things better at our organization. And we've got to get some things actually done. I'll put this quote on the screen. There is nothing so fatal to character as half finished tasks. Now I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty because I got some right here on my desk too. Okay, so we're not talking about just you know here and there. What I am talking about is multitasking so much that we never get anything to its finished point. And that makes us feel defeated because it's like I didn't get anything crossed off my list again. And we go home thinking I was busy all day, but what did I actually get finished or bring to completion? And I'm gonna encourage you to, to make sure you've got time to wrestle with where you're going and then to actually get those things crossed off your list. Okay, so that's number two, which is know where you are headed. Got the point? Looking for the little thumbs up here. Got the point? Okay, awesome. Let's go to number three. Number three is to pick yourself. Okay, so I'm going to use the, uh, the, the finger here and point to myself on this one, is pick yourself. Okay, if we were live, I would tell you all right now, and you can do it since you're on mute, you can say out loud, it's all about me. Okay, you can say it out loud to yourself, right? It's all about me. How did that feel to actually say that out loud? Bunch of selfish people in this organization. No, just kidding. Uh, but let me clarify, it's not all about you. It's just that you can't count on anyone else to help orchestrate your life unless you do it. We aren't talking selfishness. We're talking self-care and self-empowerment. 
Many people sit around their whole lives waiting for someone to pick them, like grade school recess, right? And the last one chosen, I don't know if anybody was like that on the playground, and you feel like, wah, wah, I was the last one chosen again. Don't wait to be picked, pick yourself. Our beloved quarterback, you know, Russell Wilson, his dad said to him, you know, when he was younger, why not you, Russell? Why not you? Don't be a victim, don't be a martyr. To pick yourself, you can do at least four things. So here's one of those, is get better at what you do. Get better at what you do. Self-develop. I don't care how many years you've been in your role as an HR professional, you can take it to the next level. And most of us would go, yep, yeah, we know that we're not know-it-alls uh, in our position. Even if the technical side of your job is flawless, you know all the policies, all the procedures like the back of your hand. You don't have to look in the employee handbook. When someone walks into your office, you could just quote it. That's on page seven. You know, <laughs> I don't know if any of us are that good, but you're, you would be that good. You could still get better at your job because things are always changing around us. You can even get better at the people side of things. Participate in training opportunities. I applaud all of you for being here today because you didn't have to be. Many people were not. But you said, I'm going to prioritize my professional development today. Of course, there's a lot to read. You go to the, the SHRM website, and it's just, you know, uh, bubbling over with tons of resources and forms and tools that you can go to. I read HR Magazine religiously. I, I love the, you know, new formats. Just the graphics are way better than it was like three or four years ago. But it's always relevant stuff. There's just so many places we can go to be better one year from now than we are now. A second point is to uh, take good care of yourself. Take good care of yourself. I literally had a client years ago that said self-care feels selfish to me. And I was like, I wanted to jump across the couch and go, no, you know, it, it is not because she was so interested in serving others like her family that she believed any time for herself was like wrong. And I said, no, that, that's going to help give you the strength to keep giving to those at work and your family around you. People are counting on you to be your very best self every day in the role that you play for your organization. If you go down in flames, many people are going to get let down. And I'll just give you two quick burnout, avoiding burnout tips very quickly here. One is to uh, combat stress through establishing enough recovery time. What do I mean by this? Well, You've got a weekend, it's actually using and taking your weekend. <laughs> How many of you have come to work on Monday saying, I need a weekend to recover from my weekend, <laughs> right? You packed it so much full of stuff that you are not ready for the week ahead. Um, that, when sometimes I'll do in a seminar, I'll have someone hold up uh, like a bottle of water like this, you know, out to the side, and I'll just have that person stand there. And uh, I'll say that, how much water do you think's in the bottle? Usually it's a clear bottle. And they'll say six ounces, eight ounces, 12 ounces, people will call out stuff. And I'll say, you know what, it's not, it doesn't really matter how much water's in the bottle. It's how long I'm going to have this volunteer hold this bottle out to the side. If I have them hold it for like an hour, they're going to be like, uh, Paul, you know, can I put this down now? Are we done with this illustration right now? I'm going to have a sore arm tomorrow. If I have them hold it up for eight hours, we're going to have to call a paramedic <laughs> because the arm is going to go numb. So it's not how much is on your plate. The principle is it's how long you hold it without a break. We've got to take better care of ourselves by taking our breaks. COVID has been very difficult for many of us because it blurred the lines of work and home if we're teleworking. And I found most of my clients had trouble with the hard stop in the day and going into the life part of their job. So weekends, try to take that one day, at least one of the two days, completely off. And then you've got to unplug from electronics because they just keep beeping at us and vibrating all the time. And our emails just keep coming in, even on the weekend. And it's like, man, we've, we've got to like call it, we've got to cool it somewhere. So let me ask you this. If I were to say you've got to unplug from electronics, okay, it's a requirement. What are the hours that you would love to put a boundary on for electronics that you are not going to check it. Would you go to the chat area? Let me find out, maybe you're practicing this right now, or maybe this is like, all right, I gotta do this. What are the hours between what and what that you are not gonna check your messages from work and your email? Let's find out 
what most people either are doing or want to do for staying like, you know, on my personal time. All right, we've got, a, we've got two seven to seven people, which is great. That's a whole 12 hours. That's amazing. Ooh, we got a five to seven, great. Eight thirty to six a.m. Okay, and I know many of you, many of you, still need to wrestle with this. It's like, yeah, I got to do something. Like, I need a boundary. I've got to put that in because um, work is just consuming me too much. So think about that. If you if you don't have a number there, or maybe even if you did put a number there, you may want to expand that a little bit more to have more margin in your life. The other burnout prevention tool I would give you today is. When you feel your gauge redlining, your this is a term for like personal trainers. Uh, my I had a personal trainer years ago, and I was like huffing and puffing, and she's like, "You need to go outside and get a breather because you're redlining." I'm like, "What's redlining?" That's like where you can't get your breath. It doesn't, you know, your heart doesn't come down in, in time. And I was like, "Okay, I'm going to use that excuse from now." <laughs> no, just kidding. But but I was redlining. When, when you feel this way, one of your gauges is running too hot. You're getting more irritable. You're not creative anymore. You're snapping at people. You're worrying like crazy about everything. Those are gauges. If one of those gauges is running too hot or red line, you've got to push away and step back for a brief recharge. You've got to go on a mental vacation at least once an hour. Now, don't tell your boss this like, boss, I'm on a mental vacation right now because uh, that, that probably doesn't look good on your work ethic, but you could still do this, right? You can take a quick walk around the office or around your house or do something to take a little break so that we've got a little bit of margin between the, the net first Zoom call and the next Zoom call, you know, or the, uh, the first meeting and the next meeting. We've got to do this. Also be a leader, uh, an example that others look up to. Be a leader, an example of that others look up to. Sometimes we just have to step up even when no one else does. We don't need a title. You all have a title. Uh, maybe it's not the title you eventually want. Maybe there's something aspirational you want to get to. Maybe some days you don't feel like the title carries enough weight. No matter what your role is, you can lead from the middle. You can lead from the bottom. You can lead from the top. Leaders are influencers. And when you step up and say, I'm going to take on that, I'm going to make that into a task force, and I'm going to do it. Um, that's going to model the way for others on the leadership team. And I would just encourage you again, pick yourself. Like, I'm just going to, I'm going to just take care of that issue. People respect that. People will call you uh, the go-to gal or the go-to guy when you're the one that says, I'm going to, I'm going to wrestle that one to the ground. Everybody's like, wow, that is so awesome. Thank you for taking care of that. You might actually start a good trend that, that spreads throughout your department or spreads throughout the company because everyone wins when a leader gets better. Last point on this one is to own your responsibilities. Own your responsibilities. So I think there's a, an abundance of people in life that like to blame other people for everything that goes wrong in their lives. Maybe you work with some of these folks um, and don't put their name in the chat area right now. But to blame, I like to put a little hyphen between the B and the L. To, bame, to blame is to be lame. And none of us, of course, want to be lame, but you can, you can share this with your children uh, and tell them, I don't want you to be blaming because that's, you, be lame. You don't want to be lame, do you, son, uh, on this one? There is a shortage of people that actually say, my bad, I was wrong, that's on me, I screwed up, I own it. So I'm going to encourage you not to choke on those words because it shows high maturity to own an issue, to ask forgiveness, and to double down on making that right. I put on the screen here things that you can control. We've all heard the attitude one before. Every day you can choose your attitude as you go into work. Every day you can choose your work ethic. You can choose how hard you're going to work. Every day you can also choose your maturity. Like, are you going to adult today? I don't know how that became a verb uh, a few years ago, but the adulting, you know, became a verb. We can choose we're going to act like kids or we're going to act like adults. So we can choose our maturity each day. And I, since I'm a time management guy, we can also choose our priorities every day of what we're going to work on. So there's really four things that I believe we can control uh, every single day. 
If you want a good book to read as a leadership team, it's a really short book. It's called QBQ, The Question Behind the Question. I don't know if anyone's read that one before. It's a short book. It's literally on the required reading for the Dave Ramsey organization, whether or not you like them. The point is that when you get hired in his organization, you get a bag of books. And I think, whoa, that's fascinating for onboarding. You get hired, you get a bag of books. These are the books that our company believes in that we're gonna keep quoting these over and over because it's part of our core philosophy. And QBQ is one of those, and it forces people to say, what's my role in the problem that we're in right now, instead of blaming it onto somebody else, okay? So our third point is to pick yourself. Got the point? Looking for the thumbs up here. Let's see if you're still tracking. Okay, uh, we'll do a little humor break here. Uh, you probably don't think this is funny, but uh, I did, I did hire someone to help make a funny video for me using the foam finger in other ways that did not make it into this presentation. So here we go. The foam finger, perfect for cheering on your favorite sports team, not so great for day-to-day -day activities, such as picking your nose, picking your friend's nose, pointing out directions on a map, Operating the remote control. Dancing to your favorite song. Now, Using it on your next trip here. to the auction I'm house. Now, I'm now here. It's cold. You're the buyer there. In the middle there, you've got it. Your hand up. Hitting the turtle. Helping to put out a fire. Ringing the doorbell. Playing gag games with your friends. Directing traffic in your neighborhood. Changing the social status of your friends. Threatening those that are picking on you. And finally, giving helpful advice. Remember, the foam finger. Use it wisely. All right, so maybe you don't think it was funny. It was, it was a funny idea when I thought it up, but it was the things that didn't make the cut for our presentation today. But uh, just a little humor break. I always try to put in humor in my talks virtually because it's like, oh, we've been on this phone call for this whole hour. So uh, thank you for humoring me with that one. Okay, a couple more points here. Let's go on to point number four. So when you're on your smartphones or you're on your tablet, or some other touch screen, and you're done with something, what do you do to make it get off of the screen? Okay, we, we swipe it, right? So the point here that we're gonna use the foam finger is we're gonna swish away or swipe away distractions. So point number four is to swipe away distractions. Funny, isn't it, don't you wish that sometimes you could swipe away annoying people? Like, whoo, let's just get them right out of my life right now. No, we can't do that with actual people. So here's some things that we need to remember to swipe away distractions in our life so we can stay on track. First one is to remove negative habits and mindsets from your life. I did write this little book, like Renette said, called The Static Cling Principle. And uh, it's just a real little book. I just write little books, you know, because most people only read one book a year. Can you believe that? The average American reads one book a year. So if you read more than that, you're throwing off the averages. So yeah, so, so I write little books so you can read them like in an hour and a half. But in this book, it talks about putting off bad habits and mindsets like static cling, like you pull them apart from your life. And then there's certain things that you want to put back on your life to actually, they're, they're good and they're healthy for you. And we need them in there. In the book, I talk about the, the story of the, uh, the yeah, let's, I'll, I'll just read you the quick story in here. It's talking about uh, the, uh, you might have heard it before, it's about like two wolves, and it's like which one is in our life, there's the good wolf and the bad wolf, sort of like the angel and the devil, you know, on your, on your shoulder, and which one's going to win? And so the little boy looks into his grandfather's eyes and says, which one wins, grandfather? The grandfather solemnly replied, the one I feed. And I know I've seen that in several magazines since that, that illustration of the thing that's going to win out in your life is the thing you feed, the thing you get it more energy. And so that is what happens um, when it comes to good habits. So we're going to get more of the things that we pour our energy into, and we need to replace the bad habits 
with good habits in our life. Just going cold turkey is not enough. We have to actually take out the bad habit and put a good one in that replacement principle instead. And then it's gonna take time to put those good habits in our life. How many days have you heard it takes to make a habit? How many days, just can put it over in the chat area. When you've heard like it takes X number of days to make a habit, what's the most common thing that you have heard when it comes to making a habit? Let's see what you put down here. Yep, Nevada, you, you hit the one that, that most people say right away, and that's 21 days uh, to make a habit, right? You know where that came from? It's actually not even true. Um, years ago, when people would get nose jobs, you know, plastic surgery, it would take 21 days for a nose to assimilate into the face, okay? Somehow from that, we got it takes 21 days to make a habit. It has nothing to do with habits at all. I read this in a book, I think it was called The Power of Habit. Uh, there's two good books I recommend on habits, The Power of Habit and Atomic Habits. Uh, so it's in one of those books, but it's like, no, some things will take 90 days to make into a habit, and maybe flossing takes three, you know, to make into a habit when you link it to brushing. But it's going to take real work. Also, associate with healthy people. I like this quote. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, let's see, I didn't put it on here. Uh, but a quote uh, that says, a man is known or a woman is known by the company he or she keeps. We're known by those people that are around us. Some have said it's the five closest people to us that we're going to start behaving like those five people. They call it the fist of five. Okay, who are in your fist of five that you spend the most time with? You're going to start becoming like them and maybe even adopting their value set. So it's critical to surround yourself with the right people. Schedule regular checkups with a success partner, uh, someone that keeps you accountable, with a coach, with a mentor. People helpers cheerlead our successes and they help keep us accountable to our stated goals. And as we're thinking, of course, we need to make sure we can only have one thought in our brain at a time, so we've got to make it a good one. Let's talk about establishing healthy boundaries on this point. Establishing healthy boundaries. I would say, again, a lot of my clients would say, like, I need better boundaries, okay? I just keep finding myself in the weeds, and it's like I just keep saying yes to stuff, or I keep tolerating stuff in my life and at work, my work life, and I just keep putting up with that, and now it's being too hard to address. Well, if we can get ahead of that with good boundaries, we're, it's actually going to be uh, way better for us to be able to do that. I'm going to read a fast story here, but I think it's worth the extra three minutes to actually put it into this talk. And it's about the dilemma of the bridge. One day the opportunity came for a, a young man to experience exactly the way of living he had dreamed about. But the opportunity would be available only for a short time. It would not come again. Eager to take advantage of the new open pathway, the man started on his journey. With each step, he moved faster and faster. Each time he thought about his goal, his heart beat quicker. With each vision of what lay ahead, he found renewed vigor. As he hurried along, he came to a bridge that crossed through the middle of a town. The bridge spanned high above a dangerous river. After starting across the bridge, he noticed someone coming from the opposite direction. The stranger seemed to be coming toward him to greet him, and as the stranger grew closer, the man could discern they didn't know each other, yet he looked somehow amazingly familiar. They were even dressed alike. The only difference was the stranger had a rope wrapped many times around his waist. If stretched out, the rope would probably reach the length of 30 feet. The stranger began to unwrap the rope as he walked. Just as the two men were about to meet, the stranger said, pardon me, would you be so kind to hold this end of the rope for me? The man agreed without a thought, reached out and took it. Thank you, said the stranger. He then added two hands now, and remember, hold tight. At that point, the stranger jumped off the bridge. The man on the bridge abruptly felt a strong pull from the now extended rope. He automatically held tight and was almost dragged over the side of the bridge. What are you trying to do? He shouted to the stranger below. Just hold tight, the stranger said. This is ridiculous, the man thought. He began trying to haul the man in, yet it was just beyond his strength and to haul the other back to safety. Again, he yelled over the edge. Why did you do this? Remember, said the other, if you let go, I will be lost. But I can't pull you up, the man cried. I am your responsibility, said the other. I didn't ask for this. If you let go, I will be lost, repeated the stranger. The man began to look around for help. No one was within sight. He began to think about his predicament. Here he was eagerly pursuing a unique opportunity, and now he was being sidetracked for who knows how long. 
maybe I can tie up the rope somewhere, he thought. He examined the bridge carefully, but there was no way to get rid of his newfound burden. So again, he yelled over the edge, what do you want? Just your help, cried the answer. How can I help? I can't pull you in and there's no place to tie the rope while I find someone who can help you. Just keep hanging on, said the stranger, that will be enough. Fearing that his arms could not hold on much longer, he tied the rope around his waist. Why did you do this? Don't you see what you've done? What possible purpose could you have in mind? Just remember, my life is in your hands. Now the man was perplexed. If I let go all my life, I will, I will know that I let this other man die. If I stay, I risk losing my momentum to my long sought after salvation. Either way, this will haunt me forever. As time went by, still no one came. Finally, he devised a plan. Listen, I think I know how I can save you. He mapped out the idea. The stranger would climb back up by wrapping the rope around him. Loop by loop, the rope would become shorter, but the dangling man had no interest. I don't think I can hang on much longer, warned the man on the bridge. You must try. If you fail, I die. Suddenly, a new idea struck the man on the bridge. It was different and even alien to his way of thinking. I want you to listen carefully because I mean what I'm about to say. The dangling man indicated he was listening. I will not accept the position of choice for your life, only for my own. I hereby give back the position of choice for your life to you. What do you mean? Asked the other afraid. I mean, simply it's up to you. You decide the way this, this ends. I will become the counterweight. You do the pulling and bring yourself up and I will even tug some. He unwound the rope from his waist. He braced himself to be a counterweight. He was ready to help as soon as the dangling man began to act. You cannot mean what you say, the other shrieked. You would not be so selfish. I am your responsibility. What could be so important that you would let someone die? Don't do this to me. After a long pause, the man on the bridge at last uttered slowly, I accept your choice. In voicing these words, he freed his hands and continued his journey over the bridge. Why do I tell you this story? Because it's about boundaries. Some of us are yes people and we tolerate things that we shouldn't tolerate and it hurts our life. And we, we try to swipe it away casually, but it doesn't happen. And we just keep taking on so many things. We take on the responsibility of employees who have bad behavior or bad attitudes. We take on maybe even loved ones who are being toxic in our lives. And I'm encouraging it today uh, not to let them die. Of course, that was, a, that was a story. What I'm saying is you've got to have some boundaries around your life to make sure that they don't take you down from your goals. Here are some practical points on this is to stop, look, and listen. Stop, look, and listen. So you take a little bit of a break and you think, do I wanna do this or am I trying to please someone? What will I receive from my participation? If I agree to do this, will it continue to be rewarding or will I get resentful and it'll feel oppressive? Then you look, you look at the commitments that you have on your plate and you count the cost for this commitment in front of you. You ask clarification, you try to get the full like, you know, how much is the time is this gonna take? And then the next thing is you listen for your feelings. Do I find myself hesitating or hedging? Do I feel cornered or trapped? Do I feel a tightness somewhere in my body? That's probably your body saying something to you. Do I have a nervous reaction? These are all warning signs that are within you. And that will probably help you make a good decision. And then finally, get back on track as you're swiping away uh, distractions here. I'll skip through that. Get back on track. We all get derailed on occasion but we need to bounce back. There's a lot of books out there now on resiliency and on grit and on perseverance. And there's a lot of famous people that had some really big failures, so we're not alone. Thomas Edison made a $2 million mistake on a failed uh, invention. Albert Einstein's PhD dissertation was turned down by the University of Bern. Robert Frost's poems were called frivolous by the Atlantic Monthly. So we just can't stay down when we, when we make a mistake or we fumble the ball, or we don't hit a deadline. Okay, we can't stay down. We've gotta we've got to stay in the game. So I'm gonna encourage us all to help each other cross the finish line. Your company's internal customers really need you as an HR professional to stay in the game. So our fourth point is to swipe away distractions. And hopefully you've got the point. I'll just quickly say what this last one is, and then let's go around the room and share one takeaway from today. But number five is to put a 10 on everyone's forehead every day. So I'm pointing at you. I'm, I know it's not polite to point, but to put a 10 on everyone's forehead every day. There are optimists and there are pessimists in the world. An optimist starts every day at a 10 
And if negative things happen, it goes down a little bit, but it stays pretty high. A pessimist starts the day at zero and doubts there's not gonna be much good that's gonna happen today uh, that's gonna raise it up. This is also how we view other people. I'm gonna encourage you to believe the best in people, to assume positive intent when you don't know why someone made that comment or why they had that behavior, why they were late today, you don't know why. So assume positive intent and believe the best in people. And I think they're gonna to respond to that because they're gonna feel that grace from you. And uh, hopefully they will even behave even better as a result of that. Do your part to make their day. As HR professionals, we get a chance to interact with lots of people. And so I'm gonna encourage you to not just put a 10 on their forehead, but find ways to be encouraging. In this land of COVID, we need more encouragement than ever before. We need to make people laugh more than ever before. Maybe you have to deliver something to somebody's house to cheer them up, but we've got to do a better job of doing this. Do your part to make their day and then poke people. I'll use the, the finger one more time. Poke people uh, to make right decisions as respectfully as you can. So if we don't say something, we're subtly agreeing with that person and the, the decisions they're making. So we've got to oftentimes do a little herding of cats to try to make sure people are making the right decisions. So we've got to put a 10 on everyone's forehead every day. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go around the room. I'll have you unmute here uh, for a sec. And um, if you would write down one takeaway from today, if you had more than one, that's cool too. We'll just do it for a few seconds. We only got about 15 seconds a person here. We, we talked about uh, being grounded. We talked about you know, keeping your eyes on the prize going forward picking yourself, uh, swiping away distractions, and then uh, making people's day. So I would love to know what your takeaways are today. If your name's on the screen here, I can call it. So uh, Lisa, let's start with you. What's one of your takeaways today? If you don't mind unmuting. Yeah, no problem. I really like the one-year vision exercise. I thought that was a good takeaway to have. Um, I recently had done some goal setting with uh, my work, and so that really resonated to me to just take excuse me, the time to write it out um, and, you know, take the time to really think about what I want to be in a year from now and how to accomplish that um, and really taking that look um, as to what that looks like down the future. And especially during this time right now, it's really difficult to do that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> of course, the timing's bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just that really resonated with me at the beginning where we talked about taking the time to do that. Um, and since I just had recently done a similar exercise, which uh, resonated with me as well through my work. Thank you. All right, Nevada, over to you. <sighs> the question that we should always ask on everything before we give a I'll do it is, is this helping me reach my goal? What is the end goal and will this help get me there? I like that. I love it. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Renette, what are your takeaways? Um, I was just reminded on my tech time and how much time I spend on tech and really trying to get back to minimizing that a little bit. Fantastic. Jordan. Yeah, so I have a tendency to take on a lot and I really like, you know, running it through my filter in order to make that decision, you know, you know, is this something I can add value to? Does it make sense for what I'm doing? Um, so I really like that. And on that, I'm also going to put up the certification slide for everyone for the certification credit. Um, so you guys will see that short. Sure. Thank you. Clayton, how about you? What's the takeaways you got from today? Well, first off, thanks for joining us, Paul. Really appreciate you taking sure. the time. I'm going to piggyback off of Jordan because that was my big takeaway was as you get asked to do things or just even going into things at work and, and t tackling product projects, making sure that you're getting the right people in the right spots on the bus and having it go through your filter, right? Um, to make sure that you're actually being able to give the most to it and make the biggest impact. Wonderful. Thanks, Clayton. Selena. Hi, Paul. It's nice to see you. First of all, I'm hiding behind my camera today, <laughs> eating lunch and enjoying your presentation we were at the Red Lion. Um, you know, what always resonates with me, and I need to hear this a lot, is to not take on um, other people's stress in particular when we're making tough decisions with employment that 
that is not me. And I, I really work every day to separate myself from some of this stuff. Particularly now with COVID, I have this empathy on overdrive kind of sensation happening. Mm -hmm. I have to keep reminding myself um, of that and set some boundaries around that. So I appreciate seeing you today. Good stuff. Amber. One takeaway. Are you out there, Amber? Okay, let's go to Katie. Oh, she, she Amber was on um, chat because she doesn't oh, have okay. a microphone right now. Oh, got it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, she says, removing distractions that prevent me from accomplishing my goals. Okay. Thank you, Amber. All right, Katie. Are you out there? No worries. And I feel like I missed someone. Couch. See Couch. Do you mind unmuting? Tell us what one of your takeaways was. <clears throat> or you can type them in, either one. <clears throat> All right, no worries. I want to get you out on time. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to present today. Uh, let me know if there's any way I can help. I'd be happy to send my um, speaker notes to you um, in case I had to rush through something that maybe you wanted to get down. So I'll send those to uh, the leadership and they can get those out to you. Thanks again. Thank you, Paul, so much for being with us today. Thanks, Paul. You send Bye. a virtual applause. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good day, everyone.